Explore the history of Goza-style beers with the latest book from Brewers Publications. Just released, Goza, Brewing a Classic German Beer for the Modern Era, was written by award-winning brewer Fal Allen. Goza includes 27 recipes like Sea Quench Sour from Dogfish Head Craft Brewery and the Great American Beer Festival gold medal winning Goza from Rubens Brews. Get your copy today at BrewersPublications.com. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, October 4th, 2018. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, home brewer Brooke Baber takes a cue from his background as a baker and shares his experiment in brewing with wheat and rye flour. Will it result in a gloppy, cloudy mess? Or can we add flour to our brew day ingredient list? Stay tuned. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows, our DVDs, our brewer's logbooks, and other basic brewing gear, including our tie-dye silicone pint. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, at Basic Brewing, and find our show page on Facebook as well. We have a cool Basic Brewing app on iTunes and Amazon.com, and we're found all over the place where fine podcasts are served up. And if you do us the favor of rating us on iTunes and maybe leaving a nice comment, they say that that will help new listeners to find us. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. This upcoming Monday, financial subscribers will receive an early release of our Basic Brewing video episode featuring my attempt at brewing a Brute Pale Ale. I used Enzyme in the mash to help dry out the beer. And uh, Patreon subscribers of $5 or more will also receive a behind-the-scenes video of the process. So that beer is just a memory now. It was tasty. (laughs) In its place, I kegged my scaled-up hop sampler recipe that I talked about last week. This is the beer where I didn't boil the extract word. I just brought it up barely to the boil and then added a bunch of hops and let it sit for 30 minutes. So far, the beer is a little less bitter than I hoped. It's tasty, though, and I'm hoping that the carbonation in the keg will uh, sharpen it up a bit. Uh, I'm planning to serve that beer from my Poncho's keg cooler from our sponsor, Poncho's Brewing Lab. There's news from Poncho about the keg cooler. You'll remember that Poncho's keg cooler is a 20-gallon cylindrical cooler that's designed to accommodate a 5-gallon corny keg, and it does it very well. Poncho designed the keg cooler as an alternative to jockey boxes because he didn't like them, didn't like messing with them. Well, Poncho sent me a note that he has upgraded the faucet on the keg cooler to a stainless steel retractable intertap faucet that closes automatically after you release it. Also, there's a new version available, the Poncho's Keg Cooler Pro. It comes with a Sankey tap, so the cooler can be used with a sextal or quarter barrel Sankey keg in addition to the ball lock corny. And you can customize your Poncho's Keg Cooler on his website, Poncho's Brewing Lab.com. That's P A N C H O S Brewing Lab.com. We have a little fall together, uh, get together here every year at our house, and uh, I've been using plastic kitchen trash cans to hold my kegs. <laughs> but, but they're not insulated, the ice doesn't last, and the condensation leaves a giant puddle wherever I put them. But with my Poncho's keg cooler, ice stays for days, and there's no drippy condensation mess. And it looks great, including the little uh, sticker on the front where you can write with chalk what beer you got in there. So get into fall and tailgating weather with your own Poncho's Keg Cooler from ponchosbrewinglab.com and use the code BBR to save 15% on any cooler. BBR at ponchosbrewinglab.com. I almost forgot to tell you, I, I started a batch of makgeolli, or Korean rice wine, since this past week's show. I put a, a picture on uh, Instagram about that. Uh, because next week, I'm going to run an interview I did with Thomas Cayuette on how he makes makgeolli. And it's it's super easy. Um, it's, it's kind of a step below sake. Uh, <laughs> uh, I got some nuruk from a local Korean grocery store. Now, nuruk is labeled as amylase enzyme, but uh, it's also got apparently lactobacillus and some yeast in it. It uh, it breaks down the rice into sugar uh, so the yeast can eat it. And I, I also added more yeast in there to help with the fermentation. So, uh, boy, 
it, it's a very cool process to watch. The rice breaks down into this kind of slurry, and uh, you know they you can smell the alcohol coming off of it, but it tastes great as well. So mine's still going. Uh, so I'll give you more details on my batch next week, and you can hear about Thomas's process also in next week's show. So Makali, look it up. M A K G E O L L I. Um, I have a feeling that I'm going to be making some more of that stuff. Um, let's talk about our friends and sponsors, Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa. You know, I talk all the time about High Gravity's awesome electric brewing systems with the Warthog controllers. And High Gravity also has a very cool website. No surprise, because Desiree and Dave have a background in that sort of thing, and they're good at it. The Build Your Own Beer page, for example, on highgravitybrew.com, let you select all your ingredients from one page, grain or extract, adjuncts, yeast, priming options, uh, flavorings and purees. You can even name your beer on the website. Uh, and my favorite part of the Build Your Own Beer page is that it keeps a running total at the bottom of the screen that's visible at all times. You can scroll up and down through the ingredients, and that total stays there. And High Gravity has a flat rate shipping of $7.99 on most items. So, uh, And if you're new to brewing... High Gravity has a build-your-own starter kit that lets you add on to the basic equipment kit all on one page. And, of course, there's also all the excellent electri uh, electric and electronic brewing gear to drool over and maybe put on your Christmas list as well. High Gravity has systems all the way from 5-gallon brew-in-a-bag systems to 2-barrel, 3-tier systems. Check all of them out at family-owned and operated High Gravity Brew. Dot com. That's highgravitybrew.com. And use the code EBC75BB to save 75 bucks off your electric gear purchase. Take the pain out of propane at highgravitybrew.com. Okay, if you've listened to the archives, you may remember Brooke Baber when he and his buddy David Bowder introduced us to Graf. Uh, you may remember that's the, the fictional fruit beer uh, based on the work of uh, Stephen King. Well, Brooke is back to talk about his experiment brewing with wheat and rye flour. Well, Brooke Baber, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Well, thanks, James. Uh, great to be back. Yeah, it's been, what, five years? Uh, around about there, yep. Yeah, since you and uh, David Bowder came on and talked to, uh, talked to us about Graf. And I went back and listened to that episode, and uh, man, those were those were some tasty beers. And Steve and I were pretty darn goofy on that show. So, <laughs> uh, you know, that's that's what us those of us who are your fans that's what we come for. You know, we, we like we like the interaction, we like the we like the banter. You know, it's half the fun. <laughs> well, we're a little more subdued this time for those who don't like the banter. So, uh... <laughs> Spoil nah, spoiler they don't listen alert. to the show anymore. <laughs> So you've you you've uh, given us another experiment, uh, in you it's it's another unusual ingredient. Uh, the last time that it was with the graph and with the ju the fruit juices, uh, but what what have you got uh, in store for us today? Well, uh, this all started from a beer I made out of matzo crackers. <laughs> um, yeah. I was working uh, for Trader Joe's doing beer and spirits, and uh, it was just after Passover, and someone had ordered an extra case of matzo crackers, and they were being discounted out to, I think, less than a dollar a pound. So I sat there, and I looked at the box, and I'm like, you know, I bet I can make beer out of that. <laughs> so sure enough, I bought the box home. I still have some for making beer out of, and it turns out matzo crackers are basically DME. Hmm. When it comes to their gravity and their effect, um, they ferment into just a really nice super wheat beer, like very stereotypical of what you would expect out of it, like a Hoogarten or something like that. Um, so, you know, and I ended up overshooting my gravity on that one because I didn't know how potent it really was. So I ended up making a plain, you know, wheat beer, and then the other half I turned into a black matzo cracker saison. Uh, <laughs> that came out pretty nice. Uh, so... After playing with that, I'm like, well, matzo crackers, the reason I used it is because it really is just, you know, you add water to flour and you toast it, and that's it. So why not just go right to the raw ingredients? So after I finished, I, you know, do other weird experiments. I did a beer with uh, 
lemongrass and 100% honey malt. Mm. Uh, but after that, I'm like, well, what am I going to do next? I'm like, I got some flowers from my degrees in French pastry, uh, pastry and uh, specialty baking. So, uh, you know, just because I ran a contract bakery for about 14 years, uh, I sold it a few years ago. So I still, you know, do a lot of just stuff around the house. So I have these things just laying around. And it occurred to me one day, well, if a matzo cracker will work, why not just go right to the source? So Now, now you say that uh, matzo cracker is essentially dry malt extract. There is one difference in that uh, dry malt extract is essentially just, you know, wort that has already been converted and, and just, uh, you know, has the water taken out of it. Now, now a cracker uh, is, is unconverted, so you still got to do some stuff there to, to work uh, with it, to, to brew with it. You can't just uh, dissolve some crackers in, in some water and add some uh, yeast, right? Uh, well, see, this is where I don't know. Um, because my original experiment, right? Uh, the whole idea is when I say it acts like GME, that's just as far as gravity points are concerned. You know, for every pound of matzo cracker you use, it will add gravity points just like a pound of DME. Oh, okay. So really what it comes down to is when I make a baguette, for example, if I'm doing baking uh, and I apologize for taking this off tangent, but it's relevant, I promise. Um, how does it ferment? Right. It's flour. It's water, it's salt, it's yeast. There's the only sugar present is that little one gram per ounce of native sugar to the wheat. So after doing some research, really what it is is uh, yeast, Saccharomyces, can make its own alpha amylase and beta amylase. Hmm. However, it has to ramp up in production to be able to have enough to work with. It just makes a much smaller amount than when something has it natively. So, for example, what it comes down to is the pitching rates I'm using. When I make a bread, I'm using a higher pitch rate of yeast cells as to when I make a beer where I'm using a lower pitch rate, which kind of makes sense because when I'm making a beer, it's almost like uh, the reverse of growing out, you know, a Petri dish. I'm harvesting the medium. I'm not harvesting what we grew. You know, you get rid of the yeast or you reuse it, but you're harvesting the medium, which is the beer. Where on the other side of it with the bread, it's just a matter of, well, we're going to go ahead and kill all the yeast that's present. So the amount that we add, um, actually, if you look at like the accounts and the rate at which you ferment bread is much faster than, you know, beer. So you start with a higher cell count anyway. So really, bread and beer are the same thing. It's just a matter of how much water and how much yeast. So when you made your matzah uh, beer... Did you just use it uh, unconverted or did you use some, you know, like a mash with some malted grain to, to convert it? Uh, well, I did. Um, most of these experiments, I started off thinking, OK, um, it is going to be something where this is just a source of starch. So unless I want to let it sit forever and potentially go sour, I'm going to need to actually give it some enzymes to get the ball rolling. So when I made the matzo cracker beer, for example, um, I hit it with about half the grain bill in six row, half the grain bill in matzo crackers. Now, come to find out with the amount of sugars available in those matzo crackers, you know, that's roughly like um, a two to one ratio as far as where the gravity points came from. I got twice as many gravity points out of matzo crackers as I did out of the six row. Huh. So when that's so by overshooting my gravity so much is how I ended up making multiple beers out of that. But when that actually went into the fermenter, so it did go through a mash with six row. But by the time it hit the fermenter, um, you couldn't when you try to take a gravity reading on it, it's very difficult because it's super duper cloudy and has to settle out. And by the time it hits the fermenter, you still have a lot of these starch granules that are just floating around in there. So what happens is it goes through almost like a two-stage fermentation. You'll see it ramp up, it'll die back down, and then it'll ramp up again and actually start to clarify as it eats through all those starch granules. Hmm. So I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> That's just what I noticed when I watched it. Yeah, well, I can I can picture it. And, you know, it's a, I've done a little bit of baking in my time, and I've always wondered – uh, you know, what what the yeast was eating if it's just flour and water, essentially, and, and just a little bit of uh, of sugar to get, you know, to activate the yeast. Uh, so it's just it's just doing its own conversion there in the dough. Mm -hmm. You got it. It's able to produce small amounts of alpha and beta amylase. Wow. So you were inspired by this uh, matzo cracker uh, experiment to uh, to do what you sent us. 
<laughs> which was uh, another beer, and these were done in three gallon batches. So uh, in each one, I did three pounds of six row and twenty ounces of flour. So just flour. Right, and it could be flour, or I'd cook the flour into a porridge, or it could be rye flour or rye flour porridge. But the rough breakdown of the grain bill ended up being three pounds to twenty ounces. So, roughly, you know, and since we know, or my supposition is, those you know highly ground uh, grains are going to give a way bigger sugar punch than what we're used to. So that's why I actually didn't do half and half. You know what I mean? Like that first matzo cracker beer, I ended up way overshooting the gravity as a result. Yeah, and I've, I've I've gotten questions over time uh, from from brewers who say, you know, can I just brew with flour? Can I just put flour into the into the mash? And, Answer is yes. <laughs> and traditionally, you don't want to put flour into the mash because you know it's going to stick the thing up, and you you know your your loudering is going to be all gummed up. Did you do a brew in a bag? Well, uh, yes, I basically stripped my system down the way I brew um, because I brew so many weird things. Like I said, I brewed a beer from entirely honey malt. I brew beer from things that grow in my garden, like literally anything. So I have a very simple setup. I use eight pieces of hardware, eight pieces of software on brew day, and that's it. Hmm. So when I go to brew, it literally is just a matter of getting the, you know, all the goo together in the liquid and then separating it out again using our nice little friendly muslin bags. Mm. So, so tell us about the process. Um, so the process is pretty straightforward. Uh, I, I do, again, I tend to not chill my beers either. Uh, this is part of having cut out, you know, every vector and avenue I can for infection. So a little trick I do is I make a concentrated wort. It'll be 42, roughly, uh, it'll be 4258 the way it breaks up. So if you take uh, 42% of your total, like that you want as your total finish, and freeze it as sanitized ice, cut that, drop it into the fermenter, take 58% wort that's boiling, dump it over the top, you get pitching temperature within about five minutes, you'll kill anything that's sitting on the outside of that ice or in that fermenter. Um, so that's how I tend to do a lot of these beers, get them done quickly, uh, and shorten a lot of vectors for infection. It allows me to make a lot of different types of beers without having to worry about, okay, how am I going to get it down to temperature and, you know, spending all that extra water. So making these beers, I use a brew in a bag, I use a partial mash. And then when it goes into the bucket, I actually have already set that up with a certain percentage of sanitized ice waiting for the boiling beer. Hmm. Now, what kind of containers do you freeze the ice in? Uh, just to buy them in a gallon jug and freeze them like that. How do you get the ice out? Cut it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you just take, I take the gallon jug, put it in the freezer, let it expand a little bit. As soon as I pull it out, I'll take a knife. And again, this is, you got to be, I'm a chef by training, so I'm comfortable doing it. I wouldn't, you know, if somebody else at home is going to do it, get yourself a safety razor. It makes it very easy, like a little safety box cutter, because you only need to go through a little tiny amount of plastic and just cut yourself around there and it'll drop right onto the fermenter. It's very easy. Huh. Now, so. in a callback to the earlier episode that you uh, uh, and Dave were on, uh, mm -hmm. you guys, uh, put forth the idea of freezing uh, fruit juice and putting it in the uh, in the fermenter or in the at the end of the boil to help start the chilling process this is kind of an extension of that it's exact same in fact those beers were made in the exact same way we had our frozen fruit juice dropped into and then because this the rate we used them in that was roughly a third fruit juice so it wasn't quite enough to bring it down to pitching temperatures so we still had to till just a little bit but yeah that's the exact same idea you get yourself a really good quality fruit juice freeze it in the container just cut it out of the container right into your fermenter it's sanitized it's you got nothing to worry about wow so you did a mash uh mm -hmm. and did you do like an iodine test to to test if the starches were converted at the end of that and they all did. Uh, every, in this particular experiment with the flowers, uh, they all passed iodine test. Okay, you, so there are two basically two different uh, processes that you followed, right? You did mm -hmm. uh, a, a a a porridge and a non porridge. So mm -hmm. so compare and contrast these two. Gotcha. So in one, I would take the raw grain, mix it with the flour, pour it right into the brew bags 
off it goes into the liquid and that's it. In the other one, I would take roughly uh, 32 ounces out of my brew kettle, put it into a saucepan uh, and put in the 20 ounces of flour and just stir, stir, stir. So we got a nice, you know, bubbly rolling porridge. Uh, didn't want it to burn or anything. So that's really it. it was just getting all those starches very gelatinized uh, and then into the brew bag with the grain. So, so, so just it, just water and flour? Mm-hmm. You got it. So it's, you're not making a roux at this point. You're just... <laughs> <laughs> right. No fat and flour. Although I've thought about it for a chocolate beer, but no. <laughs> <laughs> the no head retention beer. Uh, <laughs> so, so so what was the purpose of, of doing the, the porridge versus the non-porridge? Well, um, like in many things, like I think people don't realize over 50-some thousand years, our palates have evolved to detect huge subtlety. Most people, they can't tell you necessarily what they like or don't like about a beer, you know, especially if they're not, you know, some huge geek like us. Um, but they can tell you if they like it or they don't. And that is something that is a very, like as a chef, you work with that every day to try to say, okay, how can I make something that is just appealing to the human being regardless of your flavor prejudices. And this is what it comes down to is learning how to subtly manipulate, you know, does it matter if I toast my flour before I make my roux, when I make my black roux for my Cajun roux? Does it matter, you know, those little tips and tricks that grandma would use in the kitchen are also available to us as brewers because all we're doing is cooking. So really the idea comes down to is I'm going to change the nature of that starch just a little bit and see how the yeast react to eating it. Because really the flavor profile we're building here is all based on what the yeast think of this product we've given them. You know, there's really no hops to hide behind. The yeast is very clean. It's just US05. So this is kind of just trying to see what do you yeast think of these products and what kind of, you know, esters and phenols are you going to make with them? Hmm. And you, you mentioned hops. What kind of hops are we talking about? Uh, per three gallons, you have a single ounce of Cascade. At uh, the beginning of the boil? You got it. Right in there, right at the beginning, just that's it. Yeah, and, and these, and you oh, boiled for 30 minutes, right? Exactly. That's another thing. I didn't want to, because they've already had some time to get together, I didn't want to color these beers. I really wanted them to have nothing to hide behind. You know, I wanted to really try to taste the flavor of this grain, so we kept the boils very, very short. And so you, you once you boiled for thirty minutes, you chilled with the sanitized ice, uh, mm-hmm. you aerated by shaking, and then you pitched some USO five, and then you got it. Then that's it. That's it. Could so, be a whole lot simpler. <laughs> so talk about the the starting and finishing gravities. Uh, well, most of them, and again, I can contribute this down to you know maybe I didn't clean the pan all the way and get all the porridge out or whatever. Um, but the starting gravities were only different by my measurements, maximum two points, so right around ten forty, um, and they fermented out fairly strong. Uh, they fermented out fairly clear, so we're talking probably in the neighborhood of one of them's probably three point eight, three point nine. The other one's probably four percent. Um, well, and I'll say the raw wheat came out just slightly higher in gravity than our porridge version. Uh, but again, this is only, you know, a matter of, you know, less than two hundredths of a point. So it's not a huge difference. It could be down to user error or measurement error on my part. And remind me again how long you cook the porridge. Um, really, probably about 30 minutes. Okay. Of constant so probably- stirring? Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to get, you know, what you would expect that kind of just stick into the bottom of the pan. So, yeah, uh, yeah. Just give it, you know, a nice little slow stir on a slow heat. So you're exercising your chef chef muscles there. You, oh, yeah, absolutely. And the <laughs> idea is you just want it to look like, for lack of a better term, boiling sand. That's all what you're going. You just want it to go bloop, blop, bloop, blop, you know, a few, you know, bubbles coming through here and there. Uh, and you want to make sure when you put your spoon through the bottom of it, it's not sticking or, you know, you don't want to start that Maillard reaction on the bottom of the pan too heavy. You know, that's why I was trying to keep it very plain because if I cooked it a whole lot more, I could very well have toasted the grain and gone for an entirely different flavor effect. Well, cool. Is is there anything else in the process that you can think of 
uh, to talk about. They, uh, happy fermentation, does it sound like? Oh, yeah. Um, they, they were finished in a week. Uh, they tend to go right into this. They all fermented right next to each other in the same closet, so all variables on that end were as controlled as can be. Uh, no differences in environmental factors. Uh, they were all three brand new fermenters I had just bought uh, at the hardware store and converted into fermenters because luckily my local cheap hardware store sells food grade buckets. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's convenient. Um, so really, and really, what it comes down to is just making the simplest process you can. You know, my brewing, like I said, I've got it pared down to eight pieces of equipment. You know, my my false bottom is literally a vegetable steamer with the little legs ripped off the bottom. <laughs> you know, so I my my thing is keep it simple because then you actually get to learn your ingredients far more than if you're tasting your system. Well, uh, speaking of tasting, I'm just Mr. Segway today. Uh, <laughs> you <laughs> you sent us these three, and you sent like four of each beer. We got a ton of beers. <laughs> uh, I just in case something broke, I wanted to make sure. <laughs> When I got the box, I was like, holy smokes, what is all this? <laughs> well, you know, I, I believe in uh, in sharing. In re- it that way. Redundancy. That's a, yes. it's a, good, it's a good thing. Uh, and and luckily, you know, they're they're tasty beers. So uh... <laughs> Glad you liked them. That would, I guess that would have been a waste to send you a bunch of garbage. I'd have felt terrible. <laughs> I mean, I'd rather you be honest, but I'd have felt terrible. <laughs> Well, let's go to the tasting. Uh, Steve Wilkes and I of St- Steve's uh, Brewshop dot com. Fantastic. Uh, and I sat uh, outside and uh, tasted. First of all, we'll taste the red wheat flour beers. We have the uh, unporaged and the porridged. And let's go back to Steve's house. Steve Wilkes, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks, James. We're out here in the beautiful. It's a beautiful day. You're out here on your patio. Yeah. Uh, you're brewing two batches of beer at the same time. We're drinking more beer out here, too. <laughs> so what do you think of these? Here we have the A and B, which is the whole red wheat flour, uh, porridged and unporridged. A is unporridged. B uh, has the flour cooked into a porridge. Uh, so what do you think of the beers in general? They're actually pretty nice. They're very light. I'm really struck at how light and uh, refreshing they are. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't got any clue about the uh, ABV or anything like that on them, but they can't be very strong, I wouldn't think. Uh, now, the A started out at 1040, the B started out at 1038, so about 4% alcohol. That's actually a bigger beer than I than I was expecting. They drink lighter than that to me. Um, they're um, just really... Just a very light pale ale, just a tiny bit of hop character. I don't get a lot of hop character. Uh, the fermentations, I think, are both very clean. I don't get any off flavors at all. And um, they're nice beers. Yeah, they're very clear. Mm-hmm. For for a beer that was uh, fermented with, with wheat flour, uh, you know, I, w- I would have expected them to be cloudy, but they're not cloudy at all. They're very clear. There's nothing weird about these beers at all. They're both kind of lemony, citrusy. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, or, or what are your impressions? Or your what's your? <laughs> I should stop asking you that question. Yeah. Well, what's your uh, your uh, sensory perceptions? The uh, unporged beer seems lighter to me. It has a little bit less body. It also has better head retention. Now, I'm not sure uh, whether to attribute that to the beer or to the glass. Because uh, we're using some plastic glasses that we didn't beer clean, <laughs> so uh, the porridge beer doesn't have any head retention at all, at least in mine. Um, and I think I won't go into which one I prefer at the moment, but um, the unporridged one seems to have a little more going on, a little mm-hmm. more body to me. The unporridged, no porridged. Okay, yeah, yeah I'm B, sorry. B has okay. Yeah. So the porridged one seems to be a little has a little more body to me. I agree. Okay. And it's my favorite. Uh, I think it is I think it is a little more complex. Uh, they're very similar, but there is more body to it. Uh, it seems to me that I get more of a grainy uh, flavor to it. Uh, you know, neither one of them is, is a bad beer, but I think I like the I like the porridged beer better. I do too. I like it. Um, well, they're, again, they're both very drinkable little light pale ales, but the one that he he did the porridge rest on, I, 
Well, there goes Evil can evil. Yeah. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> ah, welcome to the new road next to our house. <laughs> we love it. <laughs> but yeah, both of them are good beers. Uh, I'm surprised at how good they are, uh, just because it's kind of a wacky experiment. Um, and I've had people ask me, you know, can you brew beer with flour before? And I said, well, in theory, yeah. Um, I don't know whether it's advisable or not, but yeah, we can say, yeah, it works. I would think it would be, yeah, I, I think it would work. Uh, clearly, uh, he demonstrated that it does. I would think that brewing with it would be difficult because of the dough ball factor. <laughs> I mean, just it would be very hard to brew with, I would think. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm sure that you guys will go over that part of it as well. But um, a good experiment and, you know, something fun to try. Yeah. Okay, we got the rye ones to, ta- to taste. We'll shoo off the motorcycle and uh, taste those and be back. Okay, Brooke. So far, so good. We liked the uh, we liked the the red wheat flour beers. We were both sh- surprised at how clear the beers are. And I've got the A here in front of me, and it's just as clear as it can be. And that you know, the, in a day when when uh, brewers are apparently putting flour into their you know New England IPAs or their juicy beers or whatever to make them cloudier. Uh, this seems counterintuitive. Um, well, I, I think what it comes down to is the yeast. Put it this way. Uh, again, something I learned from Basic Brewing Radio. Uh, the more that goes into the fermenter, the better your flocculation and the better you're able to coagulate those big things and let them fall out. So when I do a beer like this, nothing is left out. Everything gets poured in. True, so, but everything. You got it. So I would say, and this is just me, um, anecdotally speaking, maybe it's something we should consider as a better process that we've learned from Brasic Brewing is to include that if you want a clearer beer. Because if you know, I don't use any finding agents; I don't really touch them. Hmm. Well, the the uh, the difference between the beers uh, they were similar, but uh, we liked the poraged beer better uh, because it just had more. It just had uh, more body. It had more grain character. Uh, so it seems to me that the that the porridged beer, or it seemed to us that the porridged beer, was a better product. Is that is that what you get? Uh, well, I definitely agree with you on the flavor on the mouthfeel, uh, absolutely. And I think that just comes down to you know making sure that by the time those starches are getting together with those enzymes, they have already been through you know the heat. They have already been unfolded, and as uh, you know, we'd like to say they're untangled, so they're much easier to get to. And I think that may be it. Um, but I would say myself, I personally do like the flavor of a just because I like that tartness. I like that little bit of sharpness that I think maybe is coming out of just that raw wheat product. Hmm. You know, yeah, they were both good beer, and I think it's just a, a matter of preference between those two. Uh, I've got the A, like I say, right here in front of me now, and. Um, it is a tasty beer. It's um, it's very um, it's almost pilsner esque. If it had a little more hop character, uh, you know, if it had a little more noble hop character, I think it would make a good, a really good pilsner. Oh, I see matzo lager coming up. <laughs> Lots of matzo lager. There you go. <laughs> so yeah, these were. These were delicious beers. These wheat, these uh, wheat beers, and again, you know, remarkably cl- just crystal clear, um, and and surprising. So, uh, so going into the rye, was the was the rye any different uh, in any way in the process from the wheat? Uh, I would say, just anecdotally speaking, it is gummier. Mm, that makes sense. Um, I don't know if it's just the lignin structure in it. Uh, is a little different or what, uh, but it just seemed a little gummier. But um, and I will say this: um, there is a noticeable difference. Then this is just me because I play around a lot with stuff. Um, if you say make a sour starter, okay, for making bread, there is a huge difference in what raw grain you make your sour starter from. And in many ways, the raw flavors of these grains kind of reflect in the beer. 
Hmm. So I've made sour starters from red wheat, rye wheat, or um, red wheat, white wheat, uh, from rye, from six row, from, you know, two row, all to see what would give you kind of the different bread starters for making sourdoughs. Um, and they each have a drastically different kind of wild, funky profile they bring to it. Hmm. So, well, it yeah, have, and you can smell that when you're working with them and you're you're actually doing this stuff. You can get these aromas coming out of it pretty intensely. Huh. And and having worked with the malted rye, uh, you know, to make some gloopy wort, <laughs> I, I can attest to the uh, to the uh, you know the the viscosity that uh, rye re- it brings to the process. Well, I and mean, this is the joy of doing beers like this, though. When you're brewing a bag. You know, you can bring in, you know, this much rye and, hey, it still works. It's gloopy, but no worries. It's just in a bag. Yeah. So so it's a little more gloppy, but other than that, pretty similar to the wheat. Yeah. Uh, it really, the difference is in the aromas, you know, because I'm constantly going to be tasting it throughout the process, just seeing what I'm picking up sensorially. Uh, the aromas definitely are different. Uh, you can smell the wheat does have a little sweeter smell to it when it cooks in the porridge, and the rye does have a little more uh, earthy smell when it cooks into the porridge. And maybe those are just off-gassing, and so that's what's changing them. Uh, I'd have to do a little more research into actually what's going on during the cooking process versus raw. So are we, are we ready to go into the tasting of the of the rye beers? Um, I am, except I would probably ask you one question, James, if I may. Okay. Uh, did you try mixing them at all? Oh, no. Okay. So I'm going to try a little of that right now. i got a little <laughs> A, a little B. We're going to see, because my suspicion is, and this is just a suspicion, we may be able to get some of those body characteristics by cooking a small amount of wheat. Oh. That's good. That'll work. I kind of <laughs> like them both better together. <laughs> Two great tastes that go good together. <laughs> Might as well play with your food. There you go. All it's right, well, let, let's go back to Steve's house and taste some rye beers. Okay, here we are. We got the rye beers in front of us. We get the unporridged and the porridged rye uh, flour beers. What do you think? Um, I think that they're very different from the wheat versions of these. I'm surprised at how different they are, although maybe I shouldn't be. And I'm also surprised that in the wheat versions, the lighter beer was the unporridged. It's just the opposite in in these beers. These are the unporridged beer is uh, darker. Um, the S the 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 Lovabon color is darker, and it's much more astringent. And um, I don't want to say it's undrinkable. That's too much. But it's not my favorite. I'm not crazy about it. The other beer, the one that he made a porridge with, uh, is pretty good. I mean, it's it's okay. It it tastes like a very light rye beer, and it's it's not bad at all. That's what I think. Yeah, I think you're dead on. The uh, um, yeah, the first one is has has a bite to it. Uh, I don't know if I would go so far as to say it's astringent, but it does have a a definite bite that okay let's say it's it's more stringent to me yeah it is and and i gotta say the bouquet the nose is not pleasant i i'm not sure what that's what that is i don't think the beers have been poorly brewed i think that they're clean fermentations and they're were they're reflective of what was meant to be but the uh, the aroma coming off the first beer the un uh cooked uncooked rye flour is not pleasant it just doesn't smell good. Yeah, I don't get so much that my nose isn't working <laughs> much lately. Well, you can you can thank your lucky stars <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> I think the allergies, I think the pollen in the air. Uh, but I do like the second beer. It's um and it's and it's <clears throat> it's not too far different from the first set. It's it's more similar to the first set than the than the unporridged dry. But it might have a little more going on. We don't have them side by side anymore. But um, but it might have a little more going on the rye than than the wheat. Yeah, I think it does. It it definitely has a little bit of that rye bite, that little rye spice bite that you want from rye. Mm-hmm. Um, it's certainly not overwhelming. In the first beer, it is overwhelming um, yeah. somehow or another. Um, but in the in the cooked rye flour beer, um, it's actually a nice light. 
it doesn't really get lemony to me. I don't get a, I don't get a lot of uh, citrusy, lemony notes that that at least in your all rye beers I've, we've picked up before. Mm. But uh, it's not an unpleasant beer, and I'd certainly drink a pint of it. Yeah, it's good. Um, I think uh, yeah, I think the the first two, the wheat, did seem to bring more kind of lemony character to the to the beer uh, maybe brought out some of the either it has some lemony character on its own or it brought out the lemony character of the cascade hops um but uh yeah the only one that i didn't really like was the <laughs> mm-hmm. was the un uh, unporaged uh, rye beer and it just was kind of raw and mm-hmm. and uh astringent to me so good job brooke uh these it's a fun experiment and uh you know he says it, it, it proves that, you know, if, if it's got starch that can be converted, you can make a beer with it. So there you go. <laughs> there you go. I've got some wallpaper paste I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna be working with later today. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, James. So it's a different story, a slightly different story with the rye. Uh, we, I've got the, this, the unporaged rye here in front of me. It's, it's definitely a lot darker from the, uh, the unporaged wheat. Mm-hmm. And uh, and sipping it, it's not as um, it's not as astringent as I remembered it, but it is. There is a more of an astringency there. There's kind of a tea like you know uh, astringency that's that's uh, not as pleasant as the D was the porridged one. The porridge seemed to have knocked that astringency out. Do you get those those same perceptions? Uh, I completely agree, and I will say the Urban Knaves of Grain agree with you as well. The the what now? Uh, the Urban Knaves of Grain. I actually I'm terrible for abusing my homebrew club with all my experiments. <laughs> so, so, yeah, every time I walk up to somebody with something, they're like, "Okay, what is it?" <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, and I ba- basically I took over a little bar area in the uh, awesome brewery that lets us host our events, Alter Brewing and Downers Grove. Uh, they host our events for us to have our meetings, and we got a chance to lay them all out and let my homebrew club members try them. And about word for word, they're in locks up with you and Steve. Wow, well, that's good. Yeah, it's always uh, always helpful for when that happens. Uh, well, and it, hopefully, it gives us something we can take away from this too. Uh, Oddly enough, I really like strong flavors. You know, I like things that are very sharp. So I kind of actually like the astringent one, but that's just my palate. You know, I like that strong flavor you get from soy sauce, that strong flavor you get from miso. You know, to me, that's not necessarily unpleasant. It's just intense. And I kind of like intense flavors. Everything in balance. Indeed. Absolutely. So what? So what do you think happened? I mean, the the unporaged rye was was not as pleasant. It just was, like we said, darker and more astringent, and and just Gale or Gale. Uh, I'm, I'm reading ahead in my notes. Steve said that uh, that it had uh, kind of an unpleasant aroma as well. I didn't get the aroma. I, I don't smell as good as I used to, <laughs> in more ways than one. But. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but the but the D one the the porridge dry was actually uh, quite tasty and and a lot more similar to the first set. Yeah. Um my suspicion and again it's going to require some more research um but I think my suspicion is yes that astringency and uh, again I think some even the color effects are driven off by that foraging process. Um I my suspicion is uh, it's going to have something to do with a sulfur-based compound hmm. because it, it's going to volatilize during that heating process, but it may be affecting it differently once it's you know still a, a part of it in the mash. So my suspicion is that I was telling you, you can pick up differences in the aroma uh, when you porridge them. The uh, wheat does smell a little sweet, whereas the rye does smell more earthy, and my suspicion is it is a sulfur compound of some sort that might be driven off by that foraging process. Huh. It's interesting. Yeah, because when I smell it now, like, that's what I get is a very, like, very, very slight sulfury, but it's only, it's... That's the unporaged dry. Right, right. And, you, and you're right, it is much darker. So, again, it leads me to believe there's something that has to be volatilized. Because for the SRM difference to be this great, but the gravity difference to be not, you know, to be right in line... 
there really is no gravity difference, that would lead me to believe, yeah, there's some compound in the rye itself, in the astringency of the rye. And again, it may be completely different from what's present in malted rye. And it's and it's weird, again, it's counterintuitive that the cooked rye was lighter than the uncooked rye. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and the flavor softens considerably. It's still there, but it softens considerably. It's it's uh, it, it, it's a fun experiment. Uh, is this just a, is just is this a just a weird uh, thing to try, or is this could is this a practical application that that could be used? Uh, you know, especially with home brewers to make uh, beers. Well, I, I think it has. Uh... A, it is a fun experiment just to th- see that, you know, anything that's amylose and amylopectin is up for grabs. Don't shy away from it. Don't, you know, as long as it doesn't have a preservative in it, go to town. Um, myself, I think this is something that is actually, you know, you see a lot of innovation in beer marketing now and beers with, you know, people barrel aging and people using different hops. But we really haven't gone back to the basics and said, okay, but what else can we be making beer from and how can we get more flavor out of it than just what we get from malt? So, and I think you see that there's some, you know, things coming on the market. Like you've done a show. I learned about uh, malted sunflower you know, mm-hmm. things like that. So I think it's just a natural extension of it. Um, plus myself, my hope is to eventually open, I've got the equipment for a five barrel brewery. I'm just looking for a place to put it. Um, so, and I would like that to also be a little pizzeria and it would be great to be able to make a pizza beer, like (laughs) not a beer that tastes like pizza, but literally a beer made out of pizza dough. Yeah. Yeah. And then you could even bake it to get some, uh, right. Get some, um, some toasted character in there, some Maillard reaction going on. Right. So this not, especially if you approach beer as food, there's no limit to what you can play with. Now, I have to call back. I already mentioned her name accidentally, but Gail Williams uh, ha, is in the archives. Uh, and I believe Gail was from the San Francisco area, and she sent me uh, some uh, pasta sour beers. Nice. Uh, you know, they were de- really delicious beers, and she she made them by, you know, using pasta in the process. So... Uh, you know, there, there are already there are people out there making beer out of, <laughs> you right. know, thinking along the same same lines. So this is a starchy thing that will convert. Uh, uh, and and there's no reason not to. I made quinoa beer. Um, you know, if you find it laying around, just think about it. You might be able to turn it into a beer. You know, there's kvass I learned about from your show. Old loaves of bread turned into beer. That you know, why not do that? Well, and we and we talked to the zero tolerance uh, gluten free uh, homebrew uh, club. Uh, recently, and they're you know they're looking all around for different fermentables, you know, different things to use in their beers, you know, that don't don't have uh, gluten. So, uh, yeah, there's there's all kinds of avenues that are that are opening up nowadays. Well, and I did hear about from uh, again this guy James Spencer, uh, <laughs> brew firm or Brewers Clarex, and I ended up teaching. I, I try to make it a habit where if I work with someone, I will teach them to homebrew. I don't care what kind of time or inconvenience it takes. If you want to learn to homebrew, I will teach you. Just make time in your schedule. And so I taught someone who is actually you know a bona fide celiac. He started making hundred percent wheat beers that he could drink. Oh well, there you go. So, I mean, I, there's a future out there for this. There's no reason that I think there's no reason that those people in, you know, zero tolerance shouldn't be able to find a whole myriad of wonderful things to play with. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, if it, if it's on the shelf in the grocery store, it's a potential candidate. That's what I look at. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and especially like fruit juices, especially look around for, you know, fall time, get yourself just a good store bought cider, make a good apple beer. It's super easy. Pie fillings, all mm-hmm. kinds of stuff. <laughs> Why not? You know, old cookies, perfect. Ooh, old, ooh, old cookie. Of course, cookies don't get old around my house. <laughs> there you go. I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> well said, well said. <laughs> There's either cookies or no cookies. There's no stale right. cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> All right, Brooke. This has been a lot of fun, I, and it, no, it, same here. It's good to hear from you again, and and good to, that you're still experimenting and still having fun. Well, I, I put it this way: I don't get to do as much brewing as I like with you know work these days. Uh, but you know, the hope is to do a lot more brewing. And again, I blame it all on you. So I will try to, <laughs> I will try to include you in every. Uh, I just didn't send you my lemongrass beer because I ended up kegging all of that. 
Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I got some more lemongrass coming in, so maybe I'll send you some more prizes. Awesome. Awesome. So, I would, I would love it. Thanks, Brooke. Awesome. Oh, thank you. I appreciate all you do for the community, James. Thank you. Well, thanks again to Brooke for the kind words and for sharing the experiment. And Brooke says he's willing to answer questions about his process. So if you'll email me at uh, james at basicbrewing.com, I'll, I'll send them on to Brooke. Um, and I, I'm interested in the answers as well. Also, he says he's serious about wanting to find a home for his five-barrel brewing system. So if you're in the Chicago south Chicago suburbs and want to talk to Brooke about starting a brew pub, I can connect you too. Might be fun just to get together for a beer with him there in the South Chicago suburbs. Uh, and also, thanks as always to Steve Wilkes of stevesbrewshop.com for helping me to taste these surprisingly delicious beers. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way soon. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All-Grain, Low-Tech Lagering, and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. Get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo, and you can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store as well. You can find our logbooks where you can track and log up to 50 batches of beer. Check all that out at basicbrewingshop.com. Also, take a look at our silicone pints. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voice, and we'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. <laughs>